it's not uh, a, a far fetched for for me to say this, but China is one of the most technologically advanced company uh, countries in the world today. Welcome to It's About Data, episode thirty two. This time we're joined by frequent guest Sanjeev Mohan to discuss semantic spheres of influence and the tech industry in China. Because you mentioned crunchy data, Snowflake yeah. bought them, it's the same time as Databricks bought Neon. So we see both these companies are constantly at the logger, at loggerheads. So, so there's a new battle that's brewing now on LinkedIn. Uh, first, we we lived through a nasty data mesh versus data fabric. <laughs> Remember that? Now we don't even think about it. That was so long ago. So yeah. it's just it was battle over semantics. I think I don't yes. know that it was real. Yeah. It, so I'm coming to that. But then it was yeah. about uh, iceberg versus delta. Now it's about semantic layers. And the reason why this, yeah. this battle is brewing is because Salesforce, Snowflake. Uh, DBT, Datadog, they all got together and they came up with OSI, Open Semantic Interchange. But on the other hand, you've got Databricks at scale and they're going with at scale semantic modeling layer or something like that. Uh, so mm -hmm. basically they're two or language. Uh, Actually, it's more than that. It's, multi, it's multipolar because I mean, look at SAP Databricks. That was mm -hmm. all about semantic layer. And the fact is that SAP semantics is really impenetrable except from SAP or if SAP allows you in as a first class citizen. Yeah. And basically when I spoke with the Databricks folks, they said, look, the only way that our customers could get access to this was to basically have a data sharing connection with the with SAP and their whole semantic layer and their knowledge graph, et cetera, et cetera. I think that we're, I mean, I think that we're going to be seeing just a bunch of different semantic spheres of influence that will be in a way kind of similar to what happened with the lake house table formats, except that in this case, I don't see them all converging because there's a lot much higher value in semantics than there is in the table format. Yes. hundred percent. Yep. Interesting. So you think that Snowflake will try to keep competitors out of their semantic sphere of influence and the competitors will form their own semantic spheres of influence, basically. I think Snowflake would love to have their competitors come in there because then yeah, Snowflake would be control. kind of exactly. Yeah. Do, do, I mean, do we see their competitors? Do we see Databricks you know going in there? Um, I'm not going to hold my breath. Yeah, I mean, is it really a level playing field where you, everyone has their vote, or does Snowflake I have hope, a lot of control? Yeah, I hope it is level playing field because you know if you look at uh, in the AI space, we have modeled context protocol MCP. Yes. It was introduced by Anthropic. But OpenAI adopted it, and everybody yeah. has adopted it. Google, AWS, Azure. So it's become the the common way for an agent to communicate with a, an external tool like a database. So this should not be competing standards in semantic area. Actually, I just I beg to differ, but for one reason, one reason. Yes, logically, I would agree with you. There's no reason why this shouldn't happen. The difference is that with you know, with model context protocol, it was in a brand new market before all these context layers really had a chance to solidify. Yeah. The fact is, with semantic tiers, you have going back to business objects universe yeah. back like 30 years ago. Yeah. And so you've had these well established, and plus also like you know, with SAP, they yeah. really guarded their semantics, like you know, as the family jewels. I don't. I, I think that what we may, what we'll likely end up seeing is probably a tier that goes atop all this that translates between all the different, yeah. you know, exchange protocols. That's going to be kind of like a federation. I think that's the way it's going to. Even even Microsoft. Out. Microsoft had DAX, and then before that, yeah, right. So, yeah, uh, yeah, they, they've had two of them uh, as well. So yes, it's a good point. This is not a new space at all. But all of a sudden, it's become so important. And I can see why, because if we are going to train uh, models on structured and unstructured data, we need a common semantic. See, unstructured data was never in the picture. It was all SAP's uh, you know, data model and, and then a semantic layer for SAP. But now it's sprung wide open. It could be a PDF and I want to do rag on it. Yes. Do I know what the heck is in the PDF? I need a semantic layer. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 
Yeah, it totally makes sense. I mean, what I saw as a big driver of the semantic layer was the modern data stack itself, where suddenly you kind of like your federation discussion, mm-hmm. Tony, you could suddenly connect to any data very easily using tools like Fivetran. But what does it mean? And now you throw agents into the mix. You know, right? this is going to be so ironic coming full circle here, because I think <laughs> what we saw, you know, with, you know with, 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 with DBT, or I should say with Fivetran DBT is sort of trying to finally put the, you know, trying to finally collapse the modern data stack because that, because people, you know, basically customers are sick of the complexity. We may actually be seeing the modern data stack come back in a different way, but it's going to be the modern semantic stack. Ooh. And the, <laughs> I just, Maybe you know, so. yeah, it's like history repeating itself, but, in, but a new starting point in a new area, but the same idea. Right. You know, just remember where you heard it first. Yeah. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> and as, as modern semantic stack. Yes. Smart by Tony yeah. there. Oh gosh! Can, can we cut that? Can we end this broadcast and and and, and cut that off before your last statement, Sanjeev? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I do not want to go down infamy. <laughs> BB insight is one insight, and that insight is MSS. It took about five or six years to finally get to that insight. Yeah. So it, <laughs> yes. Yeah. You can retire now. You can live on the royalty. The royalties. Yeah. The IP. Do we want to talk about your Gulliver's travels, or should we not bother? Yeah, we, we can. We can quickly. We have a few minutes. Let's do it. So yeah, why don't we? we... It took me almost twenty years to get back to China, and then I ended up going twice uh, in a month period. First, I went to go do a keynote at an AI conference, and then second time, I went to attend uh, Ten Cents Global Analyst Day and uh, event. So think of it like Ten Cents reinvent. Uh, in China, mm-hmm. and uh, I had been watching some of these videos from influencers who go to China with their cameras, and they're talking about how amazing things are. And I always wondered why they're doing this. But I have to say, you have to go experience it. I, I would. It's not uh, a, a far fetched for for me to say this, but China is one of the most technologically advanced company uh, countries in the world today. Uh, you see wherever you go, you know, it's ele- uh, electric vehicles everywhere. And not just in this, in our country, we have only one company with two small uh, companies. There there are half a dozen. Uh, you see VR being used. I was walking down uh, the street in Shenzhen. The, the sidewalk cleaner was a robot. And uh, so, so you see how uh, deep and any conference, any event you go to, it's got all of these humanoid robots. By mm-hmm. the way, they look skeletal and they look like they have a really bad case of arthritis, but they're there. They're even doing the keynote, you know. Uh, but, but let me also give you the other side of it. I was told, like Tencent has a model called Huan Yuan, which claims to be one of the best translation model in the world. Uh, before that, the AI conference I went to also has a translation model, but there was no translation by AI. Uh, in the first conference, there was none. And in the second one, it was human uh, doing the translation. Hmm. So, so I asked around, I'm like, wait, you have the best translation model. How come you didn't use it? They're like, yeah, we don't really trust it. So that was <laughs> like, okay, mm. so you you don't even eat your own dog food because it's not 100% ready. The week I was at uh, Tencent uh, in Shenzhen, the, uh, by the way, the architecture is... Uh, is amazing. Like some of the tallest buildings in the world are in Shenzhen, malls everywhere. So I went to one of the malls. The busiest store was Apple store because mm-hmm. iPhone 17 had been announced and mm-hmm. and AirPod 3 that do the, the real-time translation between different languages. Uh, that to me is China's biggest Achilles heel is this uh, language barrier. Yes. I so for me to to uh, connect with people in Tencent, they had to uh, actually not Tencent, but some other people uh, because Tencent is has some good, uh, very good uh, networks in place. But for ordinary Chinese to communicate with me, they had to get on a VPN that allowed mm-hmm. them to 
call up WhatsApp so they could then send me a message and then they would get off VPN to do all of other things. And everybody told me, if you want to communicate with us, you need to get WeChat. So, so I'm, I'm actually amazed how China is able to, to you know, uh, do so well in technology when they're really cut off from the rest of the world. There's no LinkedIn, yeah. there's no YouTube, there's no Medium, no Substack, no Google. I do all of my work on Google Drive uh, using Google Docs. I couldn't. Uh, you cut off. Yeah. yeah. So you kind of cut off. So, which is interesting because we live on all of these platforms and we learn yeah. from it. Yes. China has its own uh, ecosystem, which is. You know, what this reminds me of is Russia during the Cold War, and they did not have access to, you know, the most, you know, you know to the most powerful computers. And so, you had Russian programmers having to work on older computers. And the result was that the pro, you know, the reason why, I mean, I think one of the reasons why Russian programmers, you know, became, you know, um, became, you know um, so well, you know, uh, I mean, you know, really lead programmers is that they had to be clever programmers to get around the limitations of their equipment. And I'm wondering if, if to some extent, the same might be true with China, or is this a different situation there where they basically have the technology, but they're just still in a separate island from the rest of the world? Yeah, uh, great uh, point about uh, Russia because they're the best mathematician. The space yes. uh, program was uh, as advanced, if not more. Even today, for an American astronaut, one of the qualifications is you have to speak Russian because you have to go live oh, in. Oh, really? Yes. You have to live in the <laughs> space station. Right. Which you is have to be able to communicate Russia. Russian. Yeah. Yes. You know, <laughs> so. Sounds good. Yeah. So I I, I think uh, by squeezing by by breaking these uh, uh, these connections, China has evolved uh, in its own uh, robotics, the space yeah. program, the EV, uh, energy, solar. I think they've uh, mm -hmm. they've really taken it to the next level. Sleek subways everywhere. By the way. To pay for the subway, to even to pay for coffee, I couldn't even use my American credit card. Really? You just have to use your phone, or how did you do it? No, use your palm. Oh, wow. really? Literally, there is there is a a, a reader in um, coffee shops. You just go hover your palm. Your palm, uh, better than biometrics, by the way. The palm is embedded. It's a three D embedding of nerves, so it's very secure. And your palm reading is then connected to WeChat, which is connected to your credit card. So, so they say that oh, China is a cashless society. It's a cardless society, not just wow. There no you card, know, no wallets. So, this should this should spark a, re a revival for fortune tellers who would read your palms. <laughs> Think about it. Yeah. <laughs> AI will read it when you pay for your coffee in the future. Yes, yes, sounds good. Yeah. Well, Sanjeev, as always, great having you. Uh, great having you telling us about your travels. Very unique experience, having such a concentrated double dose of China in a very short time. Thank you so much for having me on your podcast. It's been such a pleasure. It's yeah. always great to hang out and chat about different topics. Thank you. Well, tell us when you come back from China again. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm sure there will be no, more news soon. So we'll, we'll have yes. to find another time to hang out. So. Sounds like a plan. Thank you. Talk All to right. you later. Thank you.